Okay. So for the next part of our program, uh, th this is something new that uh, we haven't tried before, and uh, I have I have full confidence in these fine folks up here to execute it perfectly. Um, we're gonna do uh, we're we're gonna take a trip back in time uh, to sixth grade, and we're gonna do a mock debate. Uh, <laughs> So I have set up um, basically a structured debate for these folks. Uh, they're going to provide opening statements, have time to ask questions, uh, give rebuttals, and provide closing statements. And they're going to be debating their business models. Uh, and to my left here, uh, we have Paul, CFO of, uh, of Golden Road, Meg, the co-founder of Golden Road, Patrick Rue of the brewery, one of the co-founder of the brewery. Yeah. And, um, and Ben from the brewery, their uh, marketing and, and sales coordinator. So uh, these folks are going to talk about their businesses a little bit. Um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, two distinctly uh, different business models. Uh, the brewery with large format 750 milliliter packages, uh, lower volume, uh, higher margin uh, business model. Uh, Golden Road looking to uh, scale quickly, build lots of volume, uh, can uh, core core offerings that um, you know they're looking to build a loyal consumer base with. Uh, not not so much the case for the brewery. Um, lots of distinct offerings, uh, just tons of rotating beers. Um, so they're gonna talk about the uh, pros and cons of those business models as if a, uh, a new startup brewery in the room was trying to decide between the two. So I will turn it over to them. Um, because we're at the home here of Golden Road, to use a, a poor baseball analogy, we'll let the visiting team go first. The brewery uh, will kick things off with uh, six minutes for their opening statements. And I'll turn the mic over to Ben here. And I'll turn it over to Patrick. All right. <laughs> no coin flip? Usually no coin flip. Oh. This is baseball, baby. Baseball country. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Dodgers. All right. All right. Enough. Go cool. Go Angels. So, I want to kind of deflate this uh, debate by saying I don't think there is a right way to, or there isn't a proper business model to start up a brewery, as long as you're doing it a little bit differently than someone else. Um, I think, uh, yeah, from uh, Golden Road's perspective and our perspective, I think we're both doing things a little bit differently. Uh, how I think we are have been successful is our initial investment was small. Uh, we started off about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which. Might be a lot of money for, uh, it is a lot of money, but uh, compared to uh, Golden Road, uh, it might be a lesser amount, I'm guessing. Um, Slightly. This place is beautiful, by the way. <laughs> so I was able to, my, my dad and uh, mom uh, started up a, a fund for me, and I cashed that out, started my brewery, got open, bought all the equipment, pretty much used, pretty ghetto. And uh, after about a month, we ran out of money. So I was like, Dad, you, you want to be a business partner? You want to? I own a chunk of this, so we did. And uh, a little bit later, you know, we needed more money. So, hey, Dad, you want to be more of a business partner? Because we, <laughs> we, we need some more fermenters because we're barely a break even. And uh, if we want to stay that way, we need some more. We want to get better. We, want to, we need more money. So today we use uh, cash flow to continue growth. We've been growing. I think you know, early on it's easier for a craft brewer to grow uh, because you're starting off from something very small and you're growing it. Uh, if you're growing double, you know, it's 100% growth. But it's... Uh, still a moderate step. So um, been able to grow about 100% a year for a while. Now we're you know, looking at maybe 10 to 20% a year by eking out a little bit of, uh, oh, already four inch, yeah, sorry. It's going down. It's going down, bro. Shit, all right. <laughs> next, uh, next thing, we purposely don't have a flagship. Uh, we actually got rid of our best selling beer that made up about 20% of sales called Orchard White. And uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because I realized we could make 10 really cool beers with that production that we were, you know, using on a lavender scented uh, wit beer, which I didn't think, you know, it wasn't what I got into the business for. Um, we, you know, created a massive uh, barrel aging program, uh, devoting about half of our production to going into barrels. Um, so I think Ben's next. You got 300. Er. 350 seconds is how you read the clock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, just to carry on, kind of a little bit more, I guess, well, it's where we started, but where we are today and, and what we do. Chris touched on it, but um, I assume everyone here has probably seen our beer, but we do the 750 milliliter bottles. Um, you know, we're not, you know, we're, basically everything we do at the brewery is based on the concept that we got into this because we're here to, to have fun making beer. 
um, and we assume everyone is drinking our beer to have fun drinking beer. Um, so it's kind of this small niche boutique feel. This, this, that you know, that's where we want to fit. So we have these large bottles. They're not cheap, um, and it's not the most efficient way to sell your beer. A lot of people, we get a lot of feedback on it. That's not always the best, but people like the way they look. They're fun to hold. They're fun to look at. They're fun to share. Um, and that's what we like to do. We like to share our beer. Um, the labels. They're all die cut labels. Some of them have foil. Some of them have had, you know, also, you know they look like wine labels. Um, we hear that a lot. Um, they're also not cheap, but we think they, you know, just add that extra perceived value to something that's not a cheap beer. Um, and on that, our beer's not cheap. We're at the highest end of the pricing scenario. Our beers range from, at a retail level, from $8 to $40 a bottle. Um, we have some beers uh, being made with grapes right now that we might even have to raise the price on simply because the things we put into our beers are really expensive. We don't really look at cost. We just you know look for what's the best out there. Um, I know I have an email on my phone right now about us looking for some fresh peaches from right outside, Calif uh, right outside LA um, to add to a beer. We'll probably end up buying them no matter what they are just because that's what Patrick wants to make. Uh, <laughs> um, our beers are pretty inhibitive for consumers to buy and we know that. Um, we're we're the deep end. We're the deep end of the pool. I mean, we make mischief in some beers that are a little bit easier to get, especially when you see them on draft at all of these bars. But, you know, it's, it's not necessarily someone's first beer. You're not going to go out and spend 30 bucks on a bottle of beer if, you're, if the last thing you had was a blue moon. Um, but that's why like, we actually de Whoa. We depend on breweries like Golden Road and, and, you know, the bigger breweries like Stone and New Belgium to get people excited so that one day they will lead to us. Um, and as far as our distribution, well, I gotta go quick here. Um, we're distributed wide, wide and shallow, because as I said, we're not an everyday beer. It's expensive. We kind of learned very, very quickly people aren't gonna go to Vons every week and pick up our beer. Um, it's more of a special occasion thing. So we were distributed in 21 states plus DC, and um, you know, it's working for us so far. Cool. Uh, one minute. So uh, we rely heavily on having membership societies. Us being able to sell our beer directly and have a really close connection to our customers is uh, super important to us and is a big, big part of our business. Uh, between our three levels, we have about 3,000 members. If any of you guys are members in the room, thank you very much. Uh, this allows us to really have fun. Uh, brewing Mischief is great because it's, we know how to brew that, but uh, we like taking that uh, next step, being a little bit more adventurous. Um, so our model works for us because we uh, get a lot of enjoyment out of uh, doing this. I didn't want to, you know, I was going to be a lawyer. I didn't want a real job. I want something that's really fun for me and hopefully a lot of fun for uh, people to drink our beers. Um, I don't want an exit plan. Uh, I try to make it actually less appealing for uh, investment bankers to come in. Like, I don't know. If you want to buy my business, like, you have to kill me, basically. <laughs> and my wife, my wife will uh, sell it. I'm sure gl gladly to you. <laughs> um, I think in this industry, there's room for all types as long as uh, the beer is phenomenal. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, right on time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Cheers. Nice Cheers. Job. Thanks. All right. Good so luck getting it in six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was tough. Two minutes to ask questions. Oh, that's um, When you guys uh, say you cash flow finance everything, um, how tough has that been, and how much are you limited by the ceiling as far as like the off the offerings to your to your business? How how big can you grow because you cash flow finance? Uh, it's been really difficult. We. Um, you know, instead of spending a million dollars on a bottling line, we'll you know look for the fifty thousand dollar line because that's what we can afford, and we have to get rid of it at some point. But um, so we try to bootstrap a little bit. Um, has that impacted the quality of your beer at all? Um, I think it has a little bit. Um, you know, if we could afford something where we could get below a hundred uh, parts per billion on, a, on our bottling line, I think the beers might have a little bit longer of a shelf life. I think bottle conditioning helps a lot. Um, so I think it fits since we have high alcohol beers and we do bottle conditioning. Um, they're fa fairly stable, but you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, how much uh, is your draft uh, package split of your business? And do you have like an average revenue per barrel amount that you'd be willing to share uh, or see. that you look for? Yeah. So last year, I think we were 55% bottle, 45% draft. We do all six stills, so no half barrels. Um, I think for distribution, we look for around 
uh, probably 500 to 550 dollars a barrel. Do you own that Cooperage or is that a MicroStar? MicroStar. Yeah. Paul, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, I only got one really is uh, what would you do when you, if you needed the financing and uh, your father w wasn't available for that opportunity? Uh, we have now have a line of credit thanks to U.S. Bank and I'm getting getting rid of uh, the bank of dad. He's been wonderful, but awesome. you know, it makes me feel a little bit more like a man when I can go to a <laughs> bank and, <laughs> 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 and get some money. So. Awesome. And, uh, um, I, I will actually toss in one question for you guys. Uh, the, the distribution strategy uh, being in 21 states, um, has that impacted your ability to deliver fresh beer? Um, it, it would definitely uh, seem to hinder the quality if you're sending it far away. Um, well, for things like our seasonals, we try to brew them in advance to kind of, a lot of our markets we ship to about four times a year. So the beers that have uh, pretty short shelf life, we brew those towards the end when we're ready to ship. So they're getting fresh beer and the ones that can't age uh, are the ones that we brew first. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Now uh, Meg and Paul will have six minutes to uh, give their opening statements, and uh, I'm going to start the timer right now. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so I'm glad you guys, uh, five times through your debate, you said uh, the word fun. And um, when I was 22 years old, Patrick, you gave your his history. I'll give a little bit of mine with, uh, without, without Tony, my partner here, unfortunately. Um, but, but Dale Kachetis, the owner of Oscar Blues, said, if it ain't fun, I ain't doing it. You're fun, this is fun, we're doing it. And that was a business uh, that I owned that was an event management company that helped get Oscar Blues um, to national uh, events around the country. So I learned um, early on what it was to spread a, small, a very, very small brand um, on a, a seven barrel um, brew pub system on a, a two head can filler in Lyons, Colorado, um, at that point to like 20 states. So. Um, while I was living in an RV and selling beer um, from a refrigerated beer truck that ran, ran around behind us, I saw some struggles of, uh, of tanks coming in late or not at all from uh, debt financing um, that, that I said, you know, when I got together with Tony, I don't want to have happen. So I, you know, saw early on that um, there was this huge potential um, in craft beer if you're a six pack or a 12 pack on the shelf in the supermarket that you need scale to succeed. Um, so we st set forth with a, a bit of a different model, which was LA County needs a, a local craft beer producer that you can get um, everywhere from Bill's Liquor and Atwater, Sunset Beer Co. to Costco 24 packs, which are going into 51 Southern California Costco's next month. 6,500 cases. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the model that we started with. The ability for a retailer to call us and say, we want local beer and we want it next month. Not we want it next year, but as you know, when the retailers, the local buyers have a boss that says, we heard a golden road, uh, we, they want them to produce the way that uh, Anheuser-Busch produces. So, uh, Golden Road built to scale and built a model that when, when local retailers call and have a need for 4,000 cases, 6,000 cases, one case, we have the distributors um, in place. We have the kind of uh, uh, street force in place to be able, um, and especially the infrastructure and brewers in place to call on those guys. Um, so when Tony and I met, it wasn't um, how much money do we need, it was what do we need to do to provide LA County with local beer? And it wasn't necessarily about us, it was about the local community and spreading that. Um, and that we felt started and building a place like Golden Road, like Chloe's Pub that you guys are sitting in, to bring local retailers and distributors into a place where beer is a, an art form that's crafted and a culture and a lifestyle that is different from uh, the import and cocktail culture that LA had seen before us. Um, I, I just had a couple of things. The, the first thing that I'll add is uh, before you decide a business model, you should really understand what, what, uh, what your intent is out of starting a brewery. 
um, because I think the classical assumption is businesses are developed to maximize profit and you know therefore cash flow to return to the investors. But in the brewery business, I mean, I, I think that assumption needs to be a bit, a, a bit understood because that may not be the, the intent, uh, especially in uh, Patrick's model where, where he was discussing what he was trying to do. It wasn't to maximize, maximize profit. Uh, for, for Golden Road, I think our model was to try to do both, was try to make amazing, great beer, um, but also bring, bring profit uh, back to, to, our, to our investors. Um, uh, as far as the uh, economies of scale, so we're, we're in completely different market segments, so I think it's very specific to your business model needs to be tailored to your market segment and, and, and who your target market is. Uh, for the brewery, their target market is very different than our target market for, the, for Golden Road Brewing. So for Golden Road Brewing, uh, our, our market is definitely much more price sensitive than probably their market, and therefore we needed economies of scale to reduce cost, uh, to get down to, you know, our, I think our revenue per, per barrel is probably half yours. So in order, to make, in order to make money on that, we needed to actually con control cost, and therefore economies of scales. and breweries are really the de definition of economies of scales. To look at um, uh, a classic example of base malt, the, the bulk silo that we have comes out 36% price savings over the same malt that comes out in a bag, and it's exactly the same thing. It's just an economy of scale because of pricing advantages on uh, bulk purchases. So for Golden Road's business model, we really needed, uh, we really needed to be big. And the other piece of it is, is we're targeting a different part of, uh, I guess, the, uh, the curve. So for the brewery, they're targeting probably the small part of the curve um, that is going to want to have a lot of variety and willing to try new things. For Golden Road, we're trying to adopt the fat part of the curve, and so they're probably not willing to be ad as adventurous at, um, at times. And so when we're talking about flagships, I mean, Golden Road absolutely wants to have a flagship because we want to build a loyalty uh, to, a, to a brand and to a brewery so that when you know, the LA market starts to mature in their, in, their, in, their, um, uh, in, their, in their ability to drink craft beer, that they'll start to go on and, and kind of be adventurous within Golden Road, Golden Road brands. So therefore, uh, Golden Road um, having a flagship is very important while, while the brewery is not. So I mean, I would just end it on, on the fact that uh, I don't think there's one, one business model that's better. I think they're very different. I think it needs to start on what are you trying to look at when, you're, when, you're, when you start, start a brewery, uh, who, your, who your target market is, and then ultimately, what's the business, best business model to service that, that target market? Awesome. <laughs> right, right under. Great job, Paul. I, I had a clock here, right Cheers. here. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, so, Patrick and Ben, you guys will have uh, two minutes to ask questions. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, that was a great presentation. I don't have a ton of questions, but I'm kind of <laughs> curious. What, um, how big do you guys want to be? What's, uh, is there an end goal or is there a, a place where you guys plateau and grow a certain amount a year? It's really interesting. Our, our, uh, our growth model was kind of built on uh, how many licenses we have Tom here from the CCBA. Uh, Tony could own as a retailer. So um, we were looking at 60,000 barrels as the, the, the limit for Golden Road for this build out. Um, Tony and I have both become pretty romanticized by the idea that LA probably needs more barrelage for a local brewery. Um, and, and we've talked about, and we've had Anderson Business School guys present us with ideas on how many barrels that is. Uh, we're not sure how many barrels that is, but we do know that um, we're, of our home market distributor, um, we just became the number one, number one craft brewer um, there with Ace Beverage. And we are less than, 10% of their market share and their, Jason's looking around as if I'm telling proprietary information here. <laughs> we are, uh, uh, in, in most of the east side LA market, they own less than 50% of the market share. So when you're looking at your hometown uh, distributor doing less than 100,000 barrels and um, I'm giving too much time for this question. And us, less than 10% of their share. There's a ton of share there for, for us and for a lot of local beer. Um, so we'll just keep expanding the LA market and, and see what happens. And, and I would just say there, there really is no limit. As long as we can make great beer and there's people willing to buy it, we'll sell it to them. <laughs> More questions? Uh, yeah, I'll ask kind of like a follow-up. That's going to beep on me. But <laughs> um, since it's not something we do, and I'm sure a lot of people are interested, I mean, how, how has it been like getting sales of a craft beer into non-craft accounts? And Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> but rewarding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, 
I'll, I'll add one other question. Uh, you, you touched on it uh, a little bit, um, showing return to investors. Uh, with such a, a huge undertaking like you have here building out Golden Road, how do you show return to your investors uh, having invested so much up front? Um, well, I, I think the first thing is, you know, um, becoming, the, I guess the first big, big threshold is uh, cash flow positive, right? So we, we put a big investment in here, um, and we and most of it was we're running an operating loss until very recently. In fact, this quarter we became cash flow positive. So I think the first part is getting getting to the break even from the cash flow standpoint, and then thank you, thank you, and then giving, <laughs> and then and then returning the investment to the shareholders they put in this because ultimately, as much as as we love beer, we also need to give it a return to our to our investors. And, and how long do you think that'll take? The goal is three uh, years. <laughs> the the goal is three years, but we still uh, we have uh, more capital improvements to put in the brewery from a quality standpoint, a canning line and keg line. Uh, and then we have uh, about 50,000 barrels that needs to go online that we still have some CapEx to spend. So uh, Paul and I provide quarterly reports to, to our, our two partners. Um, and uh, with those, we have uh, key performance indicators for every department. Um, as long as we kind of show improvement there, our partners know. And I think uh, if you guys are starting, starting a brewery, you should know that it is an economy of scale, our model, and, um, and I think their model is more of a, a, a wine model, a quicker return. This is a, a much longer term investment um, with, a, with a higher upside um, when, you, when you hit a certain level. So that level, when I was building uh, business models um, a few years ago, was, I thought was, was around uh, 20,000 barrels of break even. Um, for, for six packs on the local retailer shelf. Uh, it can be done much sooner than that and much later than that, depending on, on where else you're investing, so. Awesome, thank you. All right, so uh, four minutes to make rebuttals. Um, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? Uh, no, it is four minutes, but uh, Golden Road's offering a rebuttal to our position. All right. Your email's correct. Four minutes to make rebuttals, uh, each of you guys, and we'll start with Golden Road. And now, Ben, here's the mic. Go for it. <laughs> uh, we're supposed to rebut oh, you? He hasn't started yet. Oh, uh, we're going? What's happening? This is where you say things about my mom. I th oh, this is where we go? This is where we go? OK. Uh, I, think it, I think it depends on your, um, on your um, the pressure level, from my standpoint, um, you know, when, when I set out to do this, when I first started, I was 22, and when I decided it was going to be a brewery and I would wanted to run it, I was 24. I had no ties to home and no um, reason to need to pay anybody back or make money for a long time. And so, um, and I didn't need to sleep at that age. Now I'm 28, so I need a little more sleep. So. Um, I w I'm just going to say, like, if, uh, if you're looking for, like, a shorter term, open a brewery and be cash flow positive and uh, get a brand out the door that isn't tied to the hardest market in the country to, s to sell anything to, which is Los Angeles, um, I would go with their model. If you're looking for a challenge and something that's going to be a lifelong uh, dedication <laughs> that um, uh, will take... Every, every bit of um, energy and focus and talent and recruiting from Anheuser-Busch, where, where Paul and some of our staff came from, um, look for deep pockets and a big market that has a big void. Golden Road isn't the, um, I think on Chris's questions, he said like a, a traditional craft model. It's not. Um, Golden Road is a model that found an opportunity in a market that needed craft beer, and that is a lot harder than um, what I moved down here for, but is more rewarding than, than uh, I could offer. So I don't know what the term rebuttal means, but so that's my, yeah. <laughs> maybe that could be due to. Okay. So the only rebuttal I would give in, um, in the brewery's business model is I, I think it's an amazing business model, but it's absolutely dependent on people and key people, uh, which I think is its greatest weakness. Uh, what we're trying to build here at Golden, Golden Road is a, a sustainable business model such that, I mean, if I, if I stepped out of this, uh, Golden Road would still produce great beer. Um, and to it's do not true, buddy. Yeah, well, uh, to, 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 to do that, you need, a, you, know, you need to invest in systems and, 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 the, and the type of you know, people and talent that can build those systems. 
to get it so that, you know, that the brewery can pr produce it. And you also need autom automation, right, to, to build high-end quality uh, consistency. I would say not quality because, I mean, your business model, you're going you're gonna to produce great beer. But if you want to make it the same beer exactly the same every time, you really need automation. Um, and then from, from that standpoint, you need the big, big investments, economies, and scales to have the return to justify that. Um, and so my only rebuttal would be, be, be with you guys is, you know, once, you know, 30 years pass and you're both, you, both of you not there, what, what, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the brewery look like? Also, Jonas <coughs> isn't here and maybe he'd pick this apart, but y your uh, distributors and your retailers are far away from you. Um, when I have a problem with Jace, he's uh, 15 <laughs> feet from me. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's right we have... Uh, yeah. We have we have nine we we have nine wholesalers that we're you know we'll s we'll sell eighteen thousand barrels of beer on and and hopefully triple digit growth after that so uh, we're trying to keep it close to home to be able to control what our wholesalers um, are doing and, and and how our retailers are treating our beer which is important to us. Cool. Great. And now you guys have uh, four minutes to uh, rebut their business model. Get that going. Cool. <laughs> we have no shortage of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think your business model is awesome. Uh, LA, you know, I love, I love being able to buy your beer. In the, you know, in Albertsons right by my house, and uh, it goes perfectly by the pool. My daughter can like knock this over and knock it in her head. It doesn't hurt her. My bottles <laughs> yeah. will give her a concussion. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I guess for us, uh, we took a you know, a slow approach. You know, we do want automation. We do want um, all these things that, you know, science has to offer us. We just, you know, can't afford it. Um, our, you know, investors at this point is myself and my dad. You know, we haven't been paid any, well, I got paid a salary. He hasn't paid a, gotten paid anything. <laughs> He's very proud though. He, got, he gets beer every month. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I wouldn't pick our business model if you want to make a lot of money really quickly, unless if, you want to shut down quickly as well, or you know, make your money and run. Right. So we just keep putting money back. Anyway. So neither of them are very profitable, Chris. Is that what you're looking for? <laughs> <laughs> so the moral of the story: if you're looking to make money, don't don't, don't invest run a in brewing. Open a, brewery. <laughs> 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 Open a distributor. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think you guys, uh, you guys have big balls. You guys are, you know, you're doing things really, uh, really adventurously and. Uh, you know, that's not me, <laughs> but I but I appreciate it. Anyway, Ben, any counterpoints? I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> we wish we had more money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to rebut that silly comment earlier, it's challenging having our brewery too. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'll give you guys each a couple minutes to make any closing statements. Um, I don't know how much time I put on there, but I'll give you guys each two minutes. Um, at this point in time, uh, basically, uh, you know, try to make the case for your, your brewery business model um, for some of the folks sitting in the room. If they were sitting on the edge, if they were sitting on the fence, um, win them over right now going to the brewery business model or to the Golden Road business model. And um, I believe we start with the brewery here. Sure. Uh, I would not pick either one of our business models. <laughs> I would say if you're, not, if you're not doing your own thing, you're not thinking hard enough about what you really want to do with your life, you know, you're going to spend the good years of your life doing this, and you don't want to you know, think about, what's Golden Road doing? Oh, I should do exactly what they're doing, or you know, vice versa for us. It should be part of your identity. Um, it should be part of your soul. You should feel really proud about what you're doing with your life. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I wrote something else down. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, no, I, would, I mean, that, what Patrick said makes sense. And even if you're someone here who's part of opening a brewery, um, I've been with the brewery for five years, um, and we're five years old. I've been there a long time. Um, Jonas, who does distribution, has been with the brewery for five years. Tyler's our brewer. He's been there for five years. Um, I took a 50% salary cut to start working for the brewery. I was coming in at four in the morning to have a beer and brew with this guy. And uh, I mean, and I love it. And, and that's the thing. That's what you should be doing. And, and we've kept a lot of staff for a long time because I think everyone's enjoying it. No one's making a lot of money, but we like what we do. Yeah. 
Uh, hey, Chris. Say one more, one more piece of advice for the new brewers. Uh, focus on your own retail first. Um, you know, you, uh, you'll be so much more successful if you can bring people in there to meet you, drink your beers in person. Um, you make a lot more money profit-wise. That's you know a great way to great way to start and make sure you don't lose a bunch of money early on. Um, we do it through our reserve society and our tasting rooms, and have been really, I mean, really the keys to uh, our success early on. You, know, you can only sell so much beer doing that. That's where you're going to rely on distributors once you get above a certain point. But yeah, and, good feedback. Uh, statement great I would agree with that retail side uh, no matter um, how much money you have sell as much as you can over the bar um, that's gonna help fund the rest of whatever your adventure is um, I would start with the concept and like Patrick Patrick said this is the rest of your life do what you're passionate about and then find the right capital partner or partners to match that um, that are gonna be with you for the long run uh, no no one here um, and no one in the craft industry is in it in it to make money and flip a business and that's uh that's not what what craft brewing is about so know your model and find the partner that understands and supports your model um that that can be with you to grow the infrastructure to get to where you want to go yeah uh the only thing i would say is 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 in any model right uh doesn't didn't matter the size everybody always underestimates the real cost um, from from cash flow forecast and all this and and just make sure before you before you take that step uh, that you understand all those costs because there's gonna be some heartache you're gonna you're gonna under forecast you're gonna have to go back and then look for funding or, or you know you realize some stuff so do your due diligence and make sure you understand all the costs um, be, before you you look at a model and again the model needs to be tailored to your to your to your market so I think you first need to understand what segment of the market you're going for you know what's the profitability in that in that market is you know if if you execute perfectly are you going to capture that market and what and what value that's going to create and then therefore you start with that number to talk about you know how much is it going to cost to get that value and you really understand if this is you know if this is a a good business model um, then again I mean if you love if you if you're looking for it for another reason other than profit which 90 percent of people in the brewing business are, are not here for profit uh, then if it's what you love then you know make it your make it your life. Thanks for the, uh, the big round of applause for these guys up here in Golden Road uh, for hosting tonight. Thank you very much. Um, I, I did, I did want to take uh, one quick moment to uh, call out some of our sponsors that helped make this event uh, happen. Uh, without them, uh, it wouldn't be uh, completely free to attend, and uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, probably walk through the doors here at Golden Road and uh, tell them that we're taking over Chloe's for the night. Um, and uh, so uh, we have Crown uh, uh, Packaging. They actually make uh, some of the cans, I believe, for Golden Road. Um, and, and Brian is actually ba in the back there if you want to talk to Brian about cans. Um, JV Northwest, uh, Wild Goose Canning, and IDD Process and Packaging. And I, I do believe I saw uh, Jeff from IDD as well. Um, and Roger is, is also here. And he was in San Diego last night. So, um, oh, there he is with the giant beard. I, I can't believe I didn't pick that out. We also have an IDD here as well. And an IDD here at Golden Road. So uh, you're seeing everything come together here right in front of my eyes. Um, thank you all for attending. If you liked what we did here tonight, uh, we do this for a full day at our business conference. Uh, we bring in folks like Kim Jordan and Jim Cook um, and all sorts of uh, folks from the investment side, the distribution side, the retail side, and uh, we talk about um, all sorts of uh, topics that you guys are interested in. So hopefully we'll see you on December 5th uh, in San Diego. Thanks for coming. <laughs>